This meeting is being recorded. Good evening. This is Steve Hunton, Vice Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governance, convening this special Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, September 7th, 2022. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for being here. A couple of quick bits of business. I uh, want to let everybody know that um, we do not have any new members or alternates to introduce tonight, I believe. If that's incorrect, let me know. Uh, we'll go ahead and do roll call, and at that point, then we'll talk about our interpreters that join us tonight. So, Melinda, I will uh, have you go ahead and do roll call. Roll call at this point. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, for our board members, we are trying to get everyone moved over. If uh, for some reason you're on the attendee side when I do call your name, don't worry. At the end of it, I will make sure that you are written down for the record as being present. All right, here we go. Uh, Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Present. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. William Lindstedt, City and County of Broomfield. I'm here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. County. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Craft uh, Tharp. Oh, George sorry. Teal is here. Sorry, I got no, a fan list right when you called my name. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, George. Uh, Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Andy Kerr of Jefferson County. Lisa Smith of Arvada, Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada, okay. Allison Coons of Aurora, Mike Kaufman of Aurora, Royce Pindell of Bennett, David Spellman of Blackhawk, Nicole Spear of Boulder. Present. Margot Ramsden of Bomar. Jan Plowski of Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Roger Hudson of Castle Pines. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Tammy Mauer of Centennial. Present. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart of Cherry Hills Village. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Cheryl Wink of Inglewood. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Rich Barrows of Georgetown. I didn't get it all unmuted. This is Lynette. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lynette. Thought I saw your name. Uh, Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Tuchere of Glendale. Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuoy. David Ott of Lockbuoy. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. Ashley Stolzman of Louisville. 
Harley Rogan of Lions. Greg Edding of Lions. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present, thank you. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Adam Way of Morrison. Meredith Lighty of North Glen. Richard Kondo of North Glen. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Stally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Rebecca White of CDOT. Sally Chafee of CDOT. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, I do believe we have a quorum and I will hand it back. Oh, I'm sorry. I did say uh, people raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we do have Randy Wheel here for the record. And uh, Allison Coombs has joined us as well. Thank you both very much. So with that, Mr. Chair, now I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have uh, ASL interpretation and also Spanish language interpretation. So I want to uh, recognize and welcome Ruth and Jess, who are the uh, ASL interpreters, and also Diego, who is our Spanish interpreter. And I believe Diego wanted to uh, provide a brief introduction. Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Diego Ponce, here today with the Community Language Cooperative. Thanks so much for having us at your meeting tonight. Um, the organizers of this meeting have made a commitment towards language justice. So as always, this means that we're here to help create a space for people to participate and engage in the language of their heart, quite simply the language that you feel most comfortable in. We'll continue using simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish today to create this space here in Zoom. Uh, once I finish saying this in English, I'll repeat it in Spanish. At that moment, we turn on the interpretation. Once the interpretation is on, you can see a globe icon that says interpretation there in the bottom right hand corner of your computer screen. Please select that globe icon when it appears on your screen and please select your preferred language. If you happen to be joining today's meeting on your cell phone or your tablet, however, I'm gonna ask you to please look for the more button or the three dots button in order to select your preferred language that way. So if you're not fully bilingual, we'll ask you to please select your preferred language so you may utilize the interpretation in case anyone were to speak in the opposite language. If you are bilingual, you can just feel free to listen to everyone in the original language. You will not have to select any language channel and you will not ever have to hear my voice. As always, when you select your language, you can always check new original audio if you wish to so you don't have to be hearing both languages at the same time. As always, I'd like to remind people, please pay attention, make sure that you're speaking at a conversational pace and please make sure that you don't pick up your reading speed. So thank you so much. Uh, buenas tardes a todos y todas. Mi nombre es Diego Pons. Estoy aquí de parte de la Cooperativa Comunitaria de la Justicia del Lenguaje. Como siempre, gracias por tenernos hoy en su reunión. Los organizadores de esta reunión se han comprometido hoy a servir la justicia del lenguaje. Lo que eso significa es que queremos crear un espacio para que todas las personas puedan participar e involucrarse en el idioma de su corazón que es simplemente el idioma en el que todas las personas se sientan más cómodas. Y hoy vamos a utilizar la interpretación simultánea aquí en Zoom para poder crear ese espacio en inglés y en español. Cuando yo termine de decir esto, se va a activar la interpretación. Ya cuando la interpretación está activada, usted va a poder observar un icono en un globo terráqueo que dirá interpretación allá abajo en la derecha de su pantalla. Por favor, seleccione ese icono en el globo terráqueo cuando aparezca en su pantalla y por favor, seleccione su idioma preferido. Pero si usted está haciendo hoy esa reunión en su celular o en su tableta, yo le voy a pedir que por favor busque la opción que dice More, que quiere decir más, o posiblemente el botón de tres puntos para que usted pueda seleccionar su idioma preferido de esa manera. Si usted no es completamente bilingüe, yo le voy a pedir que por favor seleccione su idioma preferido para que usted pueda utilizar la interpretación simultánea en caso de que alguien vaya a hablar en otro idioma. Pero si usted sí es bilingüe, se puede sentir libre hoy de escuchar a todos en su idioma original. No tendría que seleccionar ningún canal de idioma y jamás tendría que escuchar mi voz. Y como siempre, cuando usted seleccione su idioma, puede hacer clic en silenciar el audio original para no escuchar ambos idiomas al mismo tiempo. Muchas gracias. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And in just a moment. Okay, I see that the interpretation uh, item has come on. So anyone could check that. Thank you very much. And I will get started here in just a moment. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I am Steve Conklin, Vice Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors, and I will be presiding over this public hearing. Today, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the draft 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan 2022 update and also associated air quality conformity and greenhouse gas documents. Thank you everyone for participating. We do appreciate that. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents I just referenced to provide comments to the Board of Directors. I want to make it clear that no decisions will be made and no actions will be taken today related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the Board's decision-making process and will continue in upcoming meetings. Staff will make a presentation followed by our hearing public testimony. Also want to note that board members are free to ask questions of those testifying as we go. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your virtual hand via Zoom. Uh, if you join by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. This public hearing also features the live Spanish interpretation and ASL interpretation, which we've just talked about and are accessible on the Zoom interface. All comments received via email, the Dr. Cobb website, or in writing previously have been automatically included in the public hearing record and will be made available to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please email those to the secretary after you speak. With that, Jacob Rieber, Rieger, <laughs> Jacob, uh, Alvin Bedell Sanchez, and Kelsey 44 Jones of Dr. Cog will now summarize the draft 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 2022 update. Please give us your presentation. Thank you, staff. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. This is Doug Rex. Uh, do, be, before we get into the public hearing, um, I think we missed an item to approve the agenda. I did. I apologize. Right. Uh, with that, uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? And I apologize for that oversight. So moved, Harrison. Great, thank you. And do we have a second? I second the motion, Bob Pfeiffer. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, both of you. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed, nay. <laughs> Mr. Rex, thank you very much. And I apologize to everyone for that, uh, that oversight on my part. And with that, we will go to the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, good afternoon to all of our board members and members of the public who are here today. Um, Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, also with me, Alvin Badal Sanchez, our Senior Transportation Planner, and Kelsey Forford Jones, our Public Engagement Specialist. Um, first, I want to start out just by thanking everyone who um, provided comments during our 30-day public comment period, which closed yesterday, along with today's public hearing. Uh, we very much want an interactive and meaningful and transparent um, process as part of our transportation planning work at Dr. Cog. So really appreciate everyone who took time to comment, um, both during the public comment period and those who are here this evening um, to provide comment. In fact, we've received well over 300 comments. We're actually still going through the comments and compiling the comments. Uh, we had a lot of engagement with this work and, and we're very gratified by that. So thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, let's get into the presentation that we want to provide um, to you all as the board and to the public who are here this evening. Um, so starting out just the subject, what is the subject of this public hearing this evening? Uh, we are updating our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan that we had originally adopted in April of 2021. We are calling this the 2022 update. So we have updated the plan and the plan document and the appendices associated with our Regional Transportation Plan. In particular, we call out two of the appendices because they are so important to this work. Um, the first one is our air quality conformity determination documents. This is Appendix S in our plan. 
any time that we make a change to the plan, uh, a major change to the plan uh, or, or an update, uh, we update our air quality conformity determination documents. And then uh, particularly the subject of this particular update for 2022 it, that it will get into in just a moment is new state rulemaking around greenhouse gas uh, transportation, the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, as part of that rulemaking and as part of this work, uh, we were required to prepare a new appendix, Appendix T, which is the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Um, so those are the main themes or the main topics of, um, of this public hearing and the work that we've done to update the plan. Um, to get us started, let me turn it over to my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez. Alvin? Thanks, Jacob. So in addition to the federal and state requirements that Dr. Dr. Cog has for our planning process, we also uh, use our own. So through our aspirational vision established in Metro Vision, our various plans and programs flow out of that. One way that we implement Metro Vision is through our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, that is our 20 plus year vision for the transportation system. So what do we need over the next 30 years? A subset of that is the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan or what's affordable. So of all the projects or programs that we need in the region, what can we afford over the next 20 to 30 years? And then just as the regional transportation plan implements MetroVision, we have a sh short range plan, the transportation improvement program that implements the short range priorities of the regional transportation plan. As an introduction to who we are as an agency, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is a planning organization where we establish guidelines, set policy, and allocate funding in three main areas, transportation and personal mobility, growth and development, and aging and disability resources. Our planning area covers all or parts of 10 counties. That's a population of about 3.4 million people, and it spans from our Western Mountain communities in Clear Creek and Gilpin to the urban corridor along I-25 and out east to the eastern plains of Adams and Arapaho. And at least where our offices are located in downtown Denver, it's the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We play a number of different roles in the region. The one that we're discussing today that's related to our regional transportation plan is our role as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. That's a federal designation, so we lead the transportation planning process in this planning area in conjunction with the Colorado Department of Transportation and the Regional Transportation District. An introduction to why we have the Regional Transportation Plan, I already touched on how it implements the MetroVision plan. Uh, it's also multimodal, so if you were to open up the Regional Transportation Plan, you would be able to read sections on transit, on freight, uh, complete streets, what are the safety outcomes in the region. So uh, we touch on all aspects of the region's multimodal transportation system. It's also fiscally constrained. As I mentioned, it's cost feasible. So the projects and programs that we list in the plan are those that we think can be completed over the next 20 to 30 years. The Regional Transportation Plan is an important document because a project that is requesting federal or state funding through our transportation improvement program must first be listed in our regional transportation plan. So roadway capacity and transit capacity projects are first listed in the regional transportation plan and flow into the transportation improvement program. We do a major update every four years and we develop it with all of our partners in the region. So the Colorado Department of Transportation, the regional transportation district, as well as our local member governments, whole authorities and public and stakeholders. And then, as I mentioned, it is one of our requirements as a metropolitan planning organization for the Denver region. During our engagement for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we heard some consistent themes from the public and the stakeholders. Uh, and so we ended up organizing the plan, organizing the plan's investments and the outcomes in chapter four around six main priorities, safety, air quality, regional transit, active transportation, freight, and multimodal mobility. If you were to open up the plan, you would see icons and information tagged around these six priorities. The projects in chapter three are organized in these same buckets and chapter four's outcomes and performance metrics also respond to how we are achieving various aspects of those through these six priorities. Now, the reason for our update and the public hearing today is related to the greenhouse gas planning standard. This was adopted in December 2021 by the Transportation Commission of Colorado, and it applies to the Colorado Department of Transportation, 
as well as the metropolitan planning organizations in the state of Colorado, of which Dr. Cog is one. Our regional transportation plan must meet the rural emission reduction levels for four analysis years, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And we have to have an adopted plan that meets those levels by October 1st of this year. The reduction levels are a little different from our federal air quality conformity standards in that these are from a baseline and Jacob will outline what the baseline for this effort is. And as we got into this work, staff realized that it would take multiple strategies to meet these reduction levels. The rule applies to the five metropolitan planning organizations and the state of Colorado, as well as the Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, in addition to the Denver Regional Council of Governments, this also applies to the MPO of Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, Grand Junction, and Pueblo. Each of these agencies has reduction levels for four analysis years. Again, those are 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And these are in million metric tons pulled directly from the rule. We recognize that million metric tons might not be an intuitive metric for folk to understand. So we provided equivalencies for each of these. So taking 2030, as an example, 0 0.82 million metric tons is the equivalent to a little over a little over 176,000 gas-powered cars being converted to electric. So for each of these four analysis years, we provided what uh, this might intuitively mean to you and to show the aggressiveness of these reduction levels as we got into the work at the beginning of this year to adopt a plan that meets these levels. Alvin, thank you very much. I'm going to continue from here to talk about um, our strategy and our work to uh, comply with the reduction levels in the state greenhouse gas planning standard. This slide is illustrating the overall framework that we've put together through our technical analysis over the last six months or so uh, to comply with the reduction levels in the state rule. Um, essentially, it shows the major themes of strategies um, and things that we're using to comply uh, with the rule requirements. Uh, the big takeaway here is that, as we've learned through our technical analysis over the last six months, it's going to take a multitude um, of strategies um, and, and techniques to be able to meet the reduction levels in the rule. Um, this graphic shows the major sort of thematic elements of those strategies, starting with, from the upper left, our adopted programmatic investments in our adopted um, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. These are the smaller scale, non-project specific investments that are really important in our plan, um, included in our financial plan, but not identified as projects over a 30 year transportation plan. In addition to the adopted programmatic investments, we're also proposing additional programmatic investments as part of the 2022 update to the regional transportation plan. Um, through our technical analysis, we also looked at telework adjustments in our regional uh, travel demand modeling. Um, as part of the plan work. Um, we, also, um, we also looked at some project changes, which I will outline um, in our, what we call our cost feasible or fiscally constrained plan, our multimodal projects uh, from the lens or perspective of the greenhouse gas rule. Um, one of the other things we looked at in our technical analysis was observational data based on um, how the region has been developing since we originally prepared um, our land use forecasts and sort of updating um, those forecasts based on observational data um, as part of the technical assumptions within the plan. And then finally, I'll talk about this as well as provided in the greenhouse gas planning standard, uh, we're also using what are known as mitigation measures to close the remaining reduction level gap um, to meet the required reduction levels in the rule. Um, in terms of our overall process um, and workflow that we used to um, analyze and revise the plan, um, it started uh, working from left to right. Step one was our regional transportation plan baseline, as Alvin mentioned. Um, this comes from the rule. Um, the rule defines our baseline as the 2050 regional transportation plan as adopted in April of 2021 and as modeled at the time of adoption. Um, so things that were included in our modeling of the plan's investments um, became our baseline, and the reduction levels in the rule are in addition to um, the baseline itself. So the baseline is the starting point uh, for our analysis. So first step was to figure out our baseline, uh, again, the plan as adopted and as modeled at the time of adoption. Step two was to reflect all of the investments that were in our adopted plan, um, but that we had not traditionally modeled 
um, prior to um, prior to this rule. Um, and again, that relates to telework. We do model telework, but um, revisiting our telework assumptions, but in particular, the programmatic investments already in our adopted plan. Step three, um, as I mentioned, was to look at the project investment mix in our plan uh, from the lens or the perspective of the greenhouse gas rule um, and to propose changes to some projects, strategic changes to some projects in the plan um, to help us comply with the reduction levels in the rule. And then step four, um, to close the remaining gap is the mitigation measures and what's known as the mitigation action plan, which are provided for in the greenhouse gas planning standard. So in terms of um, being able to meet the reduction levels in the rule, um, all of those things put together um, end up in this chart, This um, just to walk us through this, there's a lot of numbers on this chart. Um, again, million metric tons, the measurement of the rule, um, starting from the first row, working our way down. 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Update Modeling. Um, this refers to uh, the project changes, the programmatic funding, the observed land use data, sort of grouping all of those strategies together. This table is showing the reduction amounts associated with that group of strategies as our starting point towards complying with the rule for each of the four analysis years that Alvin mentioned that we need to comply with. The second row is the additional programmatic transportation investments. Um, again, through this analysis work, we are proposing um, to invest even more in some of those non-project specific programmatic investments to help us comply with the rule, um, particularly in active transportation, which is walking and bicycling, other non-motorized transportation, complete streets retrofits um, in the region over time, signal timing, um, over time, signal timing um, investments in the region over time. Um, and then a little bit um, based on coordination with the Colorado Department of Transportation, um, some techniques that they're using around the bus staying, inner city bus service. Some of those will occur within the Dr. Cog MPO area. So we're including those as well. Um, so those, that bucket of strategies, so to speak, of the additional programmatic investments, this chart shows the reduction levels associated with those. And then the mitigation action plan, and the mitigation measures that we define through, uh, through that analysis, again, provided for in the rule uh, to close the remaining reduction gap. Uh, we don't need mitigation measures for the 2025 analysis year, but starting in 2030 through 2040 and 2050, we do need mitigation measures um, as proposed in the companion mitigation action plan. So this table shows the reduction levels associated with those mitigation measures. When you put all of those together, all of the strategies, all of the techniques that we're using uh, for compliance, um, add those up. That is the fourth row in this table, the total greenhouse gas reductions in the bold, bold black. We're showing the reduction amounts for each analysis year, again, in million metric tons. We compare those with the reduction levels required of the Dr. Cog MPO area in the bold red that Alvin showed earlier. Those come directly from the rule. We compare them to make sure that the bold black numbers um, are higher than the bold red numbers, which shows that we're demonstrating that we are achieving compliance with the reduction levels in the rule for each of the analysis years. Um, as I said, in addition to the state greenhouse gas planning standard, any time that we make a major change or an update to the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we also have our federal air quality conformity requirements that we need to meet. Our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan must address in particular ozone criteria pollutants and what's known as PM10, which is particulate matter pollutants. Air quality conformity analysis for the plan is regional. Um, so it's the entire 2050 Regional Transportation Plan and the cumulative investments in that plan. It is not based on individual projects. Um, our regionally significant transportation projects that are included in the regional uh, transportation plan are included in our travel model, um, in networks that we model, um, in our travel model, um, and in air quality conformity modeling that's done by the state. Um, and we do those things, both the regional travel modeling and the regional uh, air quality conformity modeling to demonstrate that the 2050 regional transportation plan as proposed to be updated, this 2022 update, does pass all of the pollutant emission tests that are set for us through the state implementation plan for air quality, for regional air quality conformity. Again, all of that work is documented in the updated appendix S of the 2050 regional transportation plan. So in terms of changes to the plan and this 2022 update to the plan, um, just to show you all sort of what that means in terms of the plan documents themselves, 
When we adopted the plan originally, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan in April of 2021, we adopted the main plan document, which is four chapters. It's about 180 pages. And I believe 19 appendices, Appendix A through S, uh, were part of that uh, plan ecosystem. We've given some examples on the left-hand side of the slide, not, not exhaustive of everything that's in the appendices, but those appendices do address federal and state requirements. Um, they show our methodologies, um, our documentation of our work, uh, related to developing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, and they include such things as our environmental and equity analysis, public and stakeholder engagement, our financial plan, which is a federal requirement, performance measures and outcomes, which is something that we do at Dr. Cog, but is also a federal requirement, our small area forecasts and scenario planning that we use to develop the plan, and as I mentioned, our air quality conformity documents. So in terms of the 2022 updates to the Regional Transportation Plan, we have made some routine updates to the plan document itself um, in keeping with the technical work that we presented today. We made some routine and minor updates to a few of the appendices. Not every appendix was affected, but some of them were. And so we've made those updates. As I mentioned, we made updates to the air quality conformity documents, which is appendix S. And then as I mentioned, as required by the greenhouse gas planning standard, uh, we prepared what's now appendix T, which is known as the greenhouse gas transportation report that's required by the rule. Um, it documents all of our technical analysis relating to um, complying with the greenhouse gas planning standard, the strategies that we're using, the analysis of those strategies, the emissions associated with those strategies. And it includes as required by the rule, the mitigation action plan. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kelsey Forford-Jones to talk about our public engagement and our public engagement site social pinpoint. Kelsey? Yeah, thank you, Jacob. So uh, we just wrapped up our public comment period as of yesterday, yesterday and um, part of that process was uh, hearing from the public um, their general thoughts and ideas of um, both the 2022 update and uh, more specifically the greenhouse gas transportation report. Um, and one of the ways we did that was through using our social pinpoint engagement site. Um, we had a couple features there. We listed um, all of our upcoming meetings. We had um, the plan documents or the drafted plan documents. And um, we had some um, markable plan documents so people could mark up the plans with their thoughts um, and questions. And then we also had our idea wall, which was a way for people to uh, engage in conversation and leave their general comments. And so those teeny tiny little yellow boxes on the right of your screen are just um, some of those comments that we received. And uh, we will we're still compiling those and then uh, we'll have those provided tomorrow. Um, overall, we received uh, 300 comments, um, 250 of which were through our social pinpoint site. So like I mentioned, uh, we just wrapped up our public comment period. Uh, it started with the release of the draft plan on August 7th and finished yesterday, September 6th. Um, through that process, we also held five virtual public open houses, um, two of which had live Spanish interpretation. Uh, and then we also, um, we also did a couple presentations as requested. Uh, we sent out e-blasts just to let people know that we were going through this process and wanted to hear from, uh, from everyone. Um, we also did some um, advertising on social media um, and um, yeah, got quite a bit of engagement. Thank you, Kelsey. So our process will conclude today, of course, is our virtual public hearings today, September 7th. And then from here, we're going to um, take all of the comments that we've received through our public comment period, as well as the comments that we received tonight at this public hearing. Dr. Cog staff will compile all of those comments and we will respond um, to all of those comments, um, as well as revise the plan and its associated documents as needed based on uh, the comments and the public input that we received. We will provide all of that documentation through our adoption process, which will begin on September um, we'll be making a presentation on September 14th um, to the State Transportation Commission, and then through our adoption process, 
um, on starting with September 19th with our transportation advisory committee, September 20th with our regional transportation committee, and then September 21st, our regular board meeting where we will be asking our board uh, to adopt the 2022 update to the 2050 regional transportation plan. And Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time on that. Uh, the hearing is now open for anyone who would like to comment. Again, a reminder to raise your virtual hand. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. Uh, if you've not finished by the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks at that point in time, and there will be a timer on the screen. We respectfully ask that you do not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. Uh, if you agree with things that have been said previously, a simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and is appreciated. With that, I will now call on our first speaker. Bear with me for one moment here. Uh, and in advance, I apologize for any mispronunciation. Feel free to co correct me during your comments. With that, I will call on Marie Venter as our first uh, commenter. Good evening. Um, I just want to comment first before I start the actual comments on the presentation for the board members. Um, though there's always some new work on these updates, you can hear how much is just continued on from the plan, not changing any more than is perceived necessary. And I realize it's nice to approve things and have them approved and move on, um, like seems to be scheduled. Uh, but despite the good work, it, it remains really road focused. Um, one of the early slides even had a graphic that said roads and transit, and that's revealing the main and primary focus remains roads and a bigger shift is needed to serve people of all ages and income levels and abilities, not just mainly drivers and car owners. My name is Marie Venner. I'm chair of the Small Business Alliance. Um, I'm a mother and we have um, a coalition of over 30 um, neighborhood groups, um, NAACP, Green Latinos, uh, so many organizations and business owners and faith leaders. And we thank you in advance for listening to this wide range of regional residents, um, people of all ages and abilities, homeowners and renters, in, and including the 20 to 40% in each of our communities who don't drive and who have been really overlooked um, for much of our transportation planning um, all of these years. We urge you to drop all highway widenings from your plans, I-270 next, until our air quality is restored. Expanding service for cars doesn't help achieve the 26% pollution reduction by 2025 and 50% by 2030 promised in 2019 compromise legislation. People are suffering and have for decades with worsening air quality and ozone and ongoing lack of comprehensive, connected, convenient, accessible, and affordable transit and safe, protected paths for people of all ages and abilities to get around. These are missing systems providing access for all our, that are needed now, and they should receive the big ticket investment focus these next few years. So we ask you to redirect funds and technical support now to design and build out missing systems on a fast track, um, supporting ongoing operations as well as physical infrastructure at RTD, um, expanding uh, bus rapid transit on all recommended corridors. Those are about 10 in initiating land acquisition for high density housing there. Um, and in making sure that we get a regional network of protected paths. So once again, we ask you to repurpose those large widening projects uh, to build out these missing systems for all. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marie. Uh, next speaker, Josh uh, Matilla, Josh? Yeah, uh, Madela. Madela, I apologize. No, that's totally fine. It's a, it's a tricky name, it's Finnish, so. Um, different different language root and all. Um, I just wanted to kind of start by recognizing um, all the work that's been done in this plan. It looks like it's going back years. And um, Dr. Cog has put a lot of work into this. It's it's obvious. Um, 
And, you know, again, it's really difficult to document a transit plan with so many divergent needs across our metro area. So I just wanted to recognize that really quick before I get started. Um, so yeah, again, my name is Josh Maddell. I've lived in the Denver metro area for around four years. And, um, you know, one of the pieces of this plan that appears to be missing to me is a focus on a transition to a sensible land use policy within our, within our metro. Um, and, you know, I think I noticed this when I heard people say, you know, in the comments, I kind of read through that, that board, um, where people say, you know, I need a car or congestion is a serious problem for me. And, you know, I saw those and I said, you know, that I agree with that, you know, it is a problem. And yet that feeling is a surface level symptom of the broader problem I think our metro faces, which is that we need cars because we over-designed our cities from the top down. You know, we're in this situation because of what was done in the past 60 years. And we do have an opportunity to change that at any time. Um, so, you know, I the way I see it is transportation can't easily be changed without adjustments to where and how people live in our metro. Um, and so they're kind of linked. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things I think about um, in this area of land use policy is like, you know, we have so many car trips and, it, you know, I think it's like one of the most common ones is going to the grocery store and getting food. You know, how many people who are listening to this or, or in this meeting have to drive to get groceries every week, right? Um, this isn't the case in many metro areas that have the same size as Denver all around the world. Um, and so I think we have an opportunity to really look at that and kind of investigate what's missing. And to me, I think it is kind of a, a, a less central planned land use policy um, or using it mostly for public safety rather than for, um, you know, structuring certain things and, and keeping people out of certain neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's what I'd like to see is kind of a vision of like, what if every neighborhood could have a grocery store within walking distance? You know, we would have a lot more businesses. We would have a lot more development and, or, you know, economic activity if we, if we really focused on that. Um, and it would require some big changes, but um, I think doing, trying to focus on transportation and land use together really makes sense to me because if you put, let's say you put a new high speed rail in that connects two areas, you know, you need to think about how people live in those two areas and like, are they, do they have cars? Do they need to, you know, how are they going to um, get around in their local area? Um, so I, I, there, I will say there were some things in the document that talk about land use, but I only saw it once and I'd like to see it more. I think it's an important part of, uh, of updating our transportation policy. So that's all I had. Great, thank you, Mr. Matella. Uh, next up, we have Jamie Geisen. Jamie? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jamie Geisen um, and I live in Thornton. Uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today. I'm here to express my support for the proposed updates to Dr. Cog's 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. This plan addresses the air quality crisis in the Denver metro region by creating options that will curb climate change and addresses environmental justice. I support no highway expansion on I-25 and to shift investments towards bus rapid transit. I urge you to adopt this proposed updates and to continue to move our region in a direction that better meets the needs of our community. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Jonathan Pyra. Uh, yes, John the Pira, can you hear me? Pira, thank you, yes. All uh, right, uh, yes, hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Pira, I live in Denver. I'm here to express my support for the proposed updates to your 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Given that it's geometrically impossible to continue feeding single occupancy vehicles into our growing cities, I strongly support the shift in funding away from highway lane additions, which have not proven to reduce congestion nor improve air quality, and towards systems that reliably produce the outcomes we seek, such as accessibility, equity, clean air, and clean water. Our regional air quality is in crisis, as everyone from local residents to the EPA now know. And we know that free flowing single occupancy traffic has been shown to worsen air quality as its associated increase in vehicle miles traveled far outweighs any reduced idling time. As transportation is our state's leading source of GHG emissions, our transportation system is an excellent target for change as our state strives to reach towards its pollution goals. And so I'm happy to see us making a step in the right direction here. There are only two caveats in my support for this change. First, that it does not go far enough. 
After this change, we still see about 80% of the funding through 2050 directed towards infrastructure designed for mostly single occupancy cars instead of space efficient, environmentally friendly and accessible options such as rail oriented freight deliveries, public transit, bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure. We know that we cannot reach our mobility and environmental goals by relying this heavily on expensive high VMT infrastructure. Second, more of a minor point here, I might say, but the BRT improvements, which I largely applaud, have redirected the Colfax BRT to end at its westernmost destination at Union Station. Our city in Denver is already too geared to a hub and spoke model, making east-west travel lengthy and difficult. The original plan to end at Osage was meant to align with continued federal Boulevard BRT investments, which have been accelerated by this plan, as well as West Colfax Boulevard developments to improve transit speed and reliability. This is a small change, but I feel strongly it should be reversed. Overall, I'm in support here, and I urge you to adopt the proposed updates and continue moving our region in a direction that better meets the needs of the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bira. Uh, Jonathan, or Joshua Herr, please. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Joshua Herr and I live in Westminster. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm here to express my support for the proposed updates to the Denver Regional Council of Government's 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. This plan helps to address concerns I and others throughout Colorado share with respect to climate change, environmental justice, and clean air. Given the air quality challenges and the role transportation plays in, our, in air quality degradation, I highly support the proposed update to remove the highway expansion on I-25. The shift toward expanded bus rapid transit is a far more effective solution from both a transportation and clean air perspective than expanding I-25 is. I urge you to adopt the proposed updates and continue moving our region forward towards environmental and transportation sustainability. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Herr. Uh, Matt Frommer, please. I can hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Good afternoon to the Dr. Cog board. My name is Matt Fromer. I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy at the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. I'm here this afternoon to applaud Dr. Cog's efforts to implement the greenhouse gas planning standard. As you've all seen on the news, climate disasters are increasing in frequency and intensity around the globe, and we simply cannot afford any further delay on climate action. This rule is essential to meeting our greenhouse gas reduction targets and will also deliver enormous co-benefits to Coloradans. The shift in investment toward multimodal transportation projects will reduce VMT and in doing so, will save Coloradans over $40 billion by 2050 in the form of lower vehicle operating costs, fewer crashes, lower healthcare costs, and better air quality. Climate-friendly transportation planning makes our communities safer, more affordable, and more equitable. I do wanna point out a few areas of concern. In order, in order to comply with the 2030 greenhouse gas targets, Dr. Cog developed the Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan with important strategies to reduce emissions. Things like transit-oriented development, infill development for housing and jobs, and reduced parking requirements for new development. However, these policies are controlled by local governments. And without a firm commitment to update local policies, the climate benefits from these voluntary measures are just wishful thinking. So I'd encourage Dr. Cog to work with local governments on the full implementation of the Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan. If we have any hope of meeting our 2030 climate targets, the greenhouse gas reductions from our policies must be real, additional, verifiable, enforceable and equitable, and not hypothetical. We can't solve our transportation issues without fixing our land use. Our current land use policies are driving up the cost of housing. They're fueling car-centric sprawl and the pollution and congestion it generates. They're limiting access to opportunity for thousands of people who want to live and work here. They're increasing transportation costs by forcing people to own a car if they want to participate in society. They're exacerbating Colorado's intensifying water issues. And they're wasting public investment on brand new infrastructure instead of optimizing the use of our existing system. Strategies that legalize a diversity of housing types and sizes in location efficient neighborhoods near jobs, schools, and other destinations are the key to a more affordable, healthy, and equitable community. Colorado is expected to grow by about two or three million people by 2050. So we have a real opportunity to thoughtfully locate homes and jobs in ways that build more walkable 
transit-oriented and low VMT communities. It's going to take more collaboration between all levels of government. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, Heidi Lethwood. Heidi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, board members. I'm Heidi Leithwood. I'm a Denver resident, and I'm also a climate policy analyst for 350 Colorado. We're a grassroots nonprofit organization with 20,000 members statewide, working towards just and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. I'm here today in support of the draft 2050 RTP plan update. It's a big step in the right direction. The plan recognizes that to reach our goals, we need to reduce VMTs by improving transit and bike ped infrastructure. We strongly support the plan to stop the I-25 expansion and in the future to focus any highway projects on safety, transit, and multimodal capacity instead of expansion. Expansions only induce more demand and increase congest congestion and pollution while negatively impacting DI communities. We also strongly support the proposed plan to invest in completing five BRT corridors by 2030 and the substantial increases in investments in multimodal transportation options but we hope to see more. And I agree with Marie about the gaps in the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure that need to be filled. We do have a few recommendations. In addressing equity issues, more in-depth analyses will be necessary. Analyses that will make sure projects are really benefiting disproportionately impact communities by tracking and measuring impacts. Looking at the mitigate, mitigation action plan, if they depend on voluntary local action, as Matt was talking about, they may not be effective in achieving equity, and we urge you to rethink this dependence on voluntary measures. Overall, we support the plan, but urge you to continue working to ensure good equity outcomes. We thank you for your serious work to lower greenhouse gas emissions. I was particularly happy to see that your modeling shows reductions higher than what's required by law, allowing for margin for error but we really need to follow up to ensure the modeling is correct. We hope that you'll continue to prioritize and accelerate land use and transportation projects that will lead to reduced VMTs. And we hope in the future, you continue to prioritize moving transit and multimodal projects as soon as possible into the four-year TIPs. The climate crisis is still accelerating, and so we must accelerate our response. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, get apologies for any mispronunciations. Next up, Jenny Gang. Yes, uh, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Great, yeah, you pronounced it right. Um, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Um, Jenny Gang and I'm the Transportation Campaign Manager for Conservation Colorado, a nonprofit advocacy organization working to protect our lands, air, water, and communities. In general, we are supportive of the updates to the Regional Transportation Plan intended to ensure Dr. Cog's compliance with the greenhouse gas pollution standard. We are pleased with the shift away from highway expansion and towards multimodal transportation. Reducing car dependence is one of our best tools for fighting climate change, as well as the chronic air pollution that plagues the Denver region, disproportionately affecting low-income and Black, Indigenous, Latina, and other communities of color. Mobility is a human right, and the commitment to public transit will ensure that more people are able to access the jobs, services, education, and cultural opportunities that the Denver region has to offer. However, we share other commenters' concerns about the mitigation action plan. Land use and parking reform are crucially important to our state's climate and equity goals, but necessitate more urgent action than assuming voluntary measures may be implemented by local governments. There is no guarantee that this mitigation action plan will achieve its emissions reduction goal and no guarantee that any of the benefits will be visited on disproportionately impacted communities. I'd like to call attention to one sentence in particular. The mitigation action plan currently states that some policy changes may lead to displacement of current residents and existing market rate affordable housing units. That this problem is presented without a solution is not acceptable and runs counter to the state's commitment to environmental justice. Gentrification and displacement are destroying communities in the Denver region, taking away economic opportunities, contributing to homelessness and tearing families apart. 
They are also fueling sprawl, which increases vehicle miles traveled and takes us further from meeting our emissions reduction goals. The policy-based measures in the mitigation action plan should include protections for the region's most vulnerable residents. A good place to start is with the principles of equitable transit-oriented development, which center anti-displacement and community wealth building through protections for renters, income-restricted development requirements, and community ownership. Once again, thank you for your visionary work on the RTP update and for the opportunity to comment this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I will ask staff if we have any other commenters that have uh, communicated electronically a uh, desire. I do have somebody that just popped up that we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, just a reminder to raise your virtual hand, actually a couple coming up, or if you're on the phone, dial uh, star six. With that, I will go to Jan Rose. Thank you. My name is Jan Rose and I live in Wheat Ridge. Uh, I want to express my appreciation for this very forward looking uh, proposal and its commitment to multi multimodal transportation. And I want to make a couple of suggestions that uh, take advantage of RTD's recent switch to an online app and the tracking of usage and discounts applied rather than purchasing a block of tickets for something up front. And I'd like to encourage Dr. Cog to consider that all events at greater than 100 projected attendees must provide a reservation system with at minimum mini buses and at best full-sized buses to transport crowds to and from that venue. So concerts at Red Rocks, the Great American Beer Festival, the Outdoor Retailers Expo at the Convention Center. There are any number of large activities that can benefit like the Broncos bus does, which is a big hit. Um, additionally, you can look to traffic studies and think about offering bus services from existing uh, community parking lots like at libraries and city halls and uh, elementary schools and offer bus services to the Flatirons Crossing Mall and uh, Colorado Mills Mall and places that we know a lot of traffic moves in and out and offer these people a rapid transit option that they can make a reservation towards and then finally, consider particularly for our aging and our DI community residents, the idea of expanding the model used in the area on aging, where our senior citizens can reserve uh, a bus to come and get them at their residence and take them to the doctor or to wherever they need to go. Um, and consider that as an alternative to reduce um, vehicle miles traveled and to ensure that we are meeting our goals of servicing all the residents uh, of the state. Uh, finally, I ask Dr. Cog to throw its weight behind all the regulations in waiting. Um, the e-trip program is critical. Uh, businesses must take responsibility for the uh, single occupancy vehicles they contribute we must get the clean fleet requirements completed and the clean truck rule so please put everything you've got behind those wheels and make sure those regulations happen thank you so much for your efforts thank you very much uh next up uh sheree uh, am i on yep Okay, so yeah, I just want to echo our previous sentiments and say I applaud the outreach that um, Dr. Gok has done and with the unification of these diverse stakeholders for regional transport. Um, I don't think it's quite common that cities uh, in North America have this kind of uh, event. So I really think that's commendable. And uh, in addition to expressing resounding support for this step in the right direction to a future where everyone should feel safe, regardless of how they choose to move about the city, I just like to express um, a few concerns or I guess suggestions. Um, so previous commenters have mentioned land use goes hand in hand with transportation and people actually being able to use um, transportation that's not a car. And I'd like to echo that and just expand by saying that whatever public transport or bikeways that are developed, they have to be of 
first class, like world class quality in order to actually attract the users and they have to provide an actual network for people to go. Um, so I think there's a big work to be done there. And uh, along with that, I'd also like to um, kind of express a sentiment that often when you see these plans they're at least for me, like the average uh, consumer, they're not exactly transparent, right? Because like, personally, what I feel like I can understand is like a visual mock-up, like a 3D mock-up of, okay, what is this gonna look like exactly when it's finished? And I have trouble kind of understanding some of the diagrams when they're not exactly drawn out in like a way that a lay person can understand. So I think I just like to, um, express support for a greater transparency and adherence to the original design. Because for example, for the Broadway I-25 project, you know, you have this huge plan document. And at the beginning, you have all these images of, you know, pedestrian space and uh, I don't know, this very, you know, I idealistic images. But at the end, when you see the, okay, what is the actual cross section gonna look like when the construction is finished? It's, it, it shows like, a, four lane road on uh, on each side with minimal space for pedestrians. So I just think there's a disconnect and discrepancy here that I think needs to be addressed if that these multimodal projects are going to be successful. Um, and yeah, I'm really hoping they are, but yeah, I just wanna say thank you for the ability to comment and this step in the right direction. Thank you very much for your time and comment. Uh, next up, Bicycle Colorado. Thank you. This is Rachel Holting. Can you hear me okay? We can. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this is Rachel Holting. Uh, I'm wearing three hats today as I give comments. Uh, the first is um, one of my favorite hats, which is a helmet. I am the Director of Sustainable Transportation for Bicycle Colorado. I'm also wearing another hat, which is the Mayor Pro Tem of the great city of Wheat Ridge, Colorado. And then my last hat is uh, the mother of my 16 year old son who uh, is currently working on his homework as we speak. Um, so I'm gonna just speak from each of my three perspectives. Uh, as, as the director of sustainable transportation for Bicycle Colorado, I really wanna just echo so many comments that were spoken before me around the importance of adopting this and moving forward with mitigations to make sure transportation is no longer the leading contributor to greenhouse gas, but rather uh, helping reduce those. And in particular, wanna call attention to land use, equity, and of course, a protected connected bike network that really serves people of all ages who wanna get safely to their destinations. The next hat I wanna wear is the mayor pro tem of the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, I, every day in my community, see how people get around and I see a lot of cars, but what I really notice is a lot of people who are walking, they're trying to cross Wadsworth, Federal, Sheridan, Kipling, and um, it's difficult. It's difficult to get around on foot. It's really difficult to get around on a bike. And I really see this as, as a paradigm shifting opportunity for us locally and regionally to use our transportation funding to bring our investments in our community into alignment with what our community members really need for transportation. And that is access to walking, biking, transit, and increasing our land use efficiency to make sure we're reducing the car trips necessary to get around our communities safely. And then lastly, I wanna speak as uh, the mother of a 16 year old kid who doesn't have his driver's license yet, but we're breathing down the neck of that. And um, there's really no hurry in our house. There's not much interest in driving um, because driving's not particularly desirable for him. But more importantly, I really look at his horizon and every morning when I wake up and I think about where he will be in 2050, which is 28 years from now, and what our planet and our community is going to look like, the urgency of everyone at every level taking every action they can to address our climate emergency is the first thing I think when I wake up and the last thing I think about when I go to bed. And just as a reminder, uh, 28 years ago was the year 1994. And if somebody had told us then what it would be like now in terms of scrambling to do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, I wish we had that time. So I hope that this is a floor, not a ceiling on the actions we take. And I also encourage my fellow elected officials to bring forward great new projects from their own communities for future funding. Thank you. Great, thank you for your time. 
Uh, do we have any other comments? Again, a reminder to raise your virtual hand or star six if you're on the phone. And we'll give it just a moment to see if we've got any additional comments. And also I'll ask if anyone on the board has questions at this point in time. Okay. With that, that will bring tonight's public hearing to a close. Uh, we thank everyone for your testimony and your interest and your time. Uh, very helpful. And again, all of this material will be included in uh, the board's future conversations on this topic. So thank you very much. With that, uh, bear with me for just a moment. Move ahead to the report of the chair, just two, uh, two items for you. Uh, you will be receiving board members in the near future, uh, in the coming days, uh, a survey, which is the evaluation of our executive director, Doug Rex. Uh, it's an annual process to evaluate his performance and uh, you know, help uh, build and, and continue that relationship. And that will be coming out. We really encourage you to fill that out, uh, to complete that. The, the, the more feedback we have, the better. Uh, I know the Performance and Engagement Committee that, that works on that evaluation would appreciate all the feedback that they can get on that form. So uh, please take a little bit of time and, and complete that when you see it. Uh, also, a uh, heads up that our next meeting in two weeks on September 21st will be an in-person meeting. The intent is that that will be in-person at the Dr. Cog offices, and you'll get more information on that as we get closer. Okay. With that, uh, we do have on the agenda time for public comment. And this is public comment on items where there has not been a public hearing. So we will open uh, the floor briefly if there is any comment, public comment. Uh, again, same situation, raise your virtual hand, star six if you are on the phone, or star no, nine, I'm sorry, I was given the wrong information. Um, and uh, comments are limited to three minutes if anyone has comments. So we'll give it just a moment for uh, folks to let us know about that. Okay, seeing none, we will move ahead on the agenda. Uh, next up on the agenda is the consent agenda. I do want to uh, highlight uh, one of the items in there. You will notice is the Boulder County Transit Operating Assistance Amendment. Uh, this project was previously considered by the board on our July 20th meeting, but action for this specific amendment was delayed pending further conversation between Boulder County and impacted municipalities. On August 1st, 2022, the Boulder County Subregional Forum met to discuss the project and voted to recommend it for approval to the Dr. Cog board. So that item is on the consent agenda. Just wanted to kind of close the loop to let people know that those conversations that uh, had been discussed have actually occurred. Uh, do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Uh, Director Levy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Director Teal. Second. Fantastic. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that item? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 And any opposed, nay. And the consent agenda is approved. Thank you very much. With that, we will move into, sorry, I'm juggling multiple computers here. Um, we'll move into informational briefing. The fiscal year 2022-25 Transportation Improvement Program Air Quality Multimodal Subregional Share Call number two, forum, forum recommendations. And with that, I will turn it over to Todd Cottrell. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Vice Chair. Thank so you. Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog is in the process of programming $463 million in available funds from federal fiscal year 2022 through 2027. That process is being conducted over four calls for projects. So this afternoon, each county transportation forum brings to you for information their recommendations from call two, which is the subregional share project for the current TIP containing air quality and multimodal projects. A total of 59 applications were received, totaling $186 million. Their recommendations would fund 50 of those projects. In the subregional share process, each forum receives a funding target 
which is a percent of the overall funding available. This percent is an average of the population, employment, and vehicle miles traveled within each county forum as compared to the overall region. So after the call closed on June 24th, each forum then scored, discussed, and recommended a slate of projects within their funding target. At the same time as each forum was going through that process, a public comment period was held. The public was able to indicate if they supported, had concern, or were opposed to any of the proposed projects. Each forum was able to take those comments into consideration when making their recommendations. So this afternoon, we have asked a representative from each of the forums to briefly outline their discussions and recommendation process. Again, for today, we are not seeking action on this item. The call to projects will come back for recommendation at the September 19th Transportation Advisory Committee, September 20th Regional Transportation Committee, and for action at your September 20th board meeting. So there's two more items that I would like to note before I turn it over to the individual forum representatives. Um, the first is that no wait lists are being developed as a result of calls one and two. Those projects that are not funded can simply apply within call three and or four if they wish. And second, along with the call to actions later this month that I just mentioned, staff will also bring forth a recommendation in the form of a tip policy amendment to place both call one and call two projects into the current tip. So with that, uh, we'd like to start with Adams County, which should be on the next slide. And I believe uh, Chris Chauvin from Adams County staff will explain uh, the process that they undertook. Thank, thank you very much, Todd. I appreciate the opportunity and board members, thank you for the opportunity to bring the recommendations from the Adams County Sub-Regional Forum. As you can see on the slide right here, uh, we have 12 projects that we were able to fund across seven governments. Uh, we were thankful in the fact that we did actually not have enough uh, projects to fill our full quota, uh, knowing that we're sending us some funds back into the region for redistribution for the rest of the calls, but we, were, we did not really have to horse trade a lot as, we, as it were to go through. We had several technical staff meetings where we worked through all of these logistics and all of these details from each of our local governments. We briefed our forum uh, early and let them know that they what types of projects that we were looking for and what we expected to go to the final vote. And then, of course, we actually had the final vote uh, a little bit later in the month, uh, last month. One highlight that I just want to simply bring to your attention before we move on is the Town of Bennett project, uh, which you see at the bottom of the screen. They actually have a trail project that they are working on that's in three phases. Two of those phases are in Adams County, and one of those phases is in Arapahoe County. And as most of you know, the town of Bennett does straddle our two counties. The Arapahoe County Forum uh, worked with the Adams County Forum to let us know that they did not have quite enough money uh, to, to fund the southern segment of the Bennett project, but we got all of our players together and were able to make sure that we got that third leg of the Bennett project funded. So we were very happy to make sure that our town of Bennett was able to move forward with their projects. Todd, that summarizes what I can do for the ADCOG Forum. Thank you, Chris. And as we move into the Arapahoe subregion, I believe Director Maurer was gonna to speak to those. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I've had trouble internet connection, so I'm going to keep my video off for now. Um, yeah, we, uh, our technical committee, as well as the executive committee, went through these projects and um, concurred and, and collaborated on these. And um, I don't really have a lot to say other than everybody was in agreement with what we have on our list. All right, thank you, Director Maurer. And now that both Adams and Arapahoe have um, concluded their remarks, um, I will make a little bit mention about the Arapahoe, or I'm sorry, the Bennett project um, that was mentioned with the Adams County Forum. Um, we will explain that in a little bit more detail and how some of those details did work out and how that works into these recommendations coming up in a couple of weeks as part of your recommendation and action process. All right, so now we can move on to the Boulder County subregion, and I be uh, believe Director Levy is going to speak to those. Yeah, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for the opportunity to just explain really briefly what our process was in Boulder County. You'll see 
that we had uh, 10 uh, proposals submitted. We had uh, approximately $17 million available and a little bit over $21 million in project requests. Um, like the other sub-regional forums, we, uh, the Technical Advisory Committee met and scored the projects in accordance with Dr. Cog tip policy and uh, our scoring criteria emphasize uh, Dr. Cog uh, Metro Vision goals. Um, we had a really good collaboration among our uh, Technical Advisory Committee staff as well as the forum members and we're able to unanimously recommend, or I'm sorry, not quite unanimously, but almost um, this list of projects. Uh, and you'll see we were able to fund all but two of the projects. And one of the things that I wanted to point out um, about uh, what we were able to fund is that by reducing uh, slightly the request on um, the city of Boulder request on baseline road, multimodal improvements from uh, 34, uh, $3.4 million, we, we funded that at $3.1 million. We were able to go down to the bottom of the list where we had some smaller projects proposed, one by Commuting Solutions for wayfinding uh, along the 119 uh, corridor that we're working heavily on and the other uh, by the town of Nederland. We were able to fund those smaller projects uh, and, um, and, and that was something I think the, the entire forum um, felt good about and was able to support. So that uh, I think is what I wanted to share with the board about uh, this funding process. And I wanna thank Todd Cottrell and the other uh, Dr. Cog staff that join us for our forums and provide um, helpful input and guidance. Thank you, Director Levy. So next, as we move on to the Broomfield Forum, I believe uh, Mark Ambrosi with Broomfield staff is going to uh, talk about these. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Um, uh, good afternoon, my name is Mark Ambrosi. I'm a senior transportation planner uh, with the city and county of Broomfield and a participant on developing the projects for Broomfield's Transportation Forum. Um, Broomfield is somewhat unique in comparison to some of the other subregions because we are a city and county and so uh, we do not compete with with other municipalities or jurisdictions, um, uh, and uh, I guess likewise our our apportionment is somewhat smaller than than some other communities. So we have a much more limited list of projects uh, being shown. Um, so our process to begin, uh, Broomfield established a technical working group uh, comprised of staff to identify projects that. Um, fit the multimodal air quality criteria um, that we were able to deliver along the timelines that were established for the funding pool. Um, and uh, that would use up approximately the, the funding that we had available uh, through call two of the, the process. Um, on May 13th, uh, uh, staff brought projects that were identified by the working group um, to the Broomfield Forum, uh, seeking approval for our applications. We also gathered peer agency support um, for our airport creek under our trail underpass project from Jefferson County and the city of Westminster. Um, uh, following that, Broomfield established a panel of staff uh, from our capital improvements program, uh, the transportation department, uh, traffic, open space and trails to score projects that we had identified. Um, our scores ended up being very consistent. Uh, from the committee. Uh, we also received a number of comments uh, with only one comment, um, I guess, uh, that expressed concern about the project. Um, and we had identified that uh, the concerns were going to be addressed uh, through various other efforts in the, the city and county. Um, our scoring panel made a recommendation to Broomfield's Forum to fund the project up to the amount available uh, with our sub-regional funds. And on August 1st, uh, the forum reviewed the project uh, and made a motion to recommend approval of the project to the Dr. Cog board. So that was a roundup of our process. Todd, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so as we move into the, the, the Denver uh, subregion, I believe Director Williams is going to speak to those. Thank you, Todd. Uh, yes, and similar to Broomfield, uh, Denver, we were able to really corral all of our cities within our county and come up with a great list here. Um, I, I, I think, you know, one of the focuses we had this, this go around um, 
and, and trying to be strategic about how we utilize federal funds. Of course, when we federalize a project that adds a certain element of extra cost to it. So I wanted to be very strategic, looking for kind of larger scope projects uh, on here. Want to make sure that these projects uh, are benefiting our existing multimodal, our existing air quality, uh, and really looking for projects that um, intersect with uh, CDOT and CDOT right of way on there. Uh, similar to other subregions, utilized a technical subcommittee, uh, ultimately uh, uh, recommended uh, these four projects you see on your screen. First up, East Colfax BRT. Uh, this is uh, further design of the bus rapid transit. This is from Civic Center to Yosemite. Uh, this uh, th uh, 3 million amount will be coupled with uh, existing 12 million from the regional share for a total of 12 million or 15 million. Uh, next up, the South Platte River Trail, the section from Mississippi uh, uh, to the northern city limits. Uh, this is an approximately three mile segment, uh, upgrading the trail, better path, shoulders, lighting, wayfinding. Uh, and new connections to Ruby Hill Park, getting into again, um, making sure we're building out those, those existing connections. Bucktel, uh, a complete street and Evans uh, intersection improvements. Again, we've got a high comfort bike facility, ped crossing improvements, uh, other safety enhancements along there, a uh, number of different uh, road treatments as well um, to make five intersections going through here, uh, hopefully much safer. And then finally, uh, another exciting one, uh, uh, a Jewel Evans bridge going over Santa Fe that will connect kind of the east side, you know, Broadway area uh, over to both the light rail station and, and basically the, the west side of, of Denver. Uh, if you're familiar with this area, uh, especially the Evans, I would not call that a high comfort way to cross over Santa Fe and the, the rail. Uh, so we are very excited uh, to get this pro uh, project moving ASAP uh, and make a very important connection. With that, I'll stop there. Todd, always happy to answer any questions. Perfect, thank you, Director. So as we move into Douglas County, I believe Art Griffith from Douglas County staff is going to say a few words. Hi, good evening, Art Griffith. Um, we had um, six of our seven um, groups that were represented on the technical working group to review and score projects. And we additionally had uh, Dr. Cog's staff involved in the scoring. Um, the scoring was fairly closely related, um, unique to our call for projects. We had already uh, set aside 4 million of the essentially uh, 17.9 million in funding for the Lone Tree Mobility Hub, which uh, received 4 million in call one. So we completed that funding commitment um, off the top. Um, and like I said, the project were fairly closely scored. Um, we um, had selected um, five additional projects uh, utilizing the Dr. Cog scoring method and the technical working group, and then unanimously supported by the steering committee, um, looked at uh, reducing all the submittals slightly to add an, another project um, to one of the agencies um, that um, um, hadn't received a project. So um, we're really happy with the list of projects that were selected and we were able to um, you know, add one more project by everybody volunteering to take uh, slightly less amount than they originally submitted. So that's it for me. Um, Perfect, thank you, Art. So moving on to the Jefferson County subregion, uh, Steve Durian from County Staff is going to speak to these. Thank you, Todd. I'm Steve Durian with Jefferson County and I'm representing the Jefferson County Forum here tonight. Uh, we have uh, several projects we've identified. It represents a broad diversity of projects within Jefferson County. And uh, we are, uh, our requests are almost exactly in line with the uh, funding available for the Jefferson County subregion. I think we were $80,000 over in our requests and City of Golden was gracious enough to add $80,000 uh, of <coughs> a local match to 
to make the, uh, the, 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 the project list fit our available funding. So we're very happy with the results. We're very, uh, uh, we get along very well here in Jefferson County. We're able to work through any differences and come up with a good list of projects. So I'm uh, thankful to Todd and his staff for helping us uh, get through this process and make the best decisions for the people of Jefferson County. Perfect, thank you, Steve. Uh, and last, we have the Southwest Weld uh, County subregion and Elizabeth Wel Relford from County staff will speak to these. Thanks so much, Todd. I appreciate being here with you guys this evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, I'm happy to be here on behalf of the so Southwest Weld County uh, Subregional Forum. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we are a small area and, and get small funding, but uh, we try and do what we can with it. Uh, you can tell we only had two projects, so it wasn't uh, very difficult to fight over arm wrestle for the funding, even though we have nine, I guess, 11 communities in our small region um, for to be able to apply. Um, I would say the one thing maybe that we've done different than the other forums this go round is because we do have a lot of small communities that um, maybe don't have the staffing or resources to support uh, federal projects. We did hold a special uh, forum project application meeting uh, that on April 7th that uh, Dr. Cog was very gracious to assist with going through the process. Uh, CDOT staff participated for the local agency perspective to really uh, walk these small communities through um, what it means to be a local agency for sure. these projects so that we could try and get more communities to um, participate or apply for funding in the future. And so we are optimistic that we can expend all the future funding. Uh, we are leaving some of the funding on the table to give back, uh, but for now we uh, appreciate Longmont uh, stepping up and, and looking at trying to help us out with the majority of the funding for this, this go round. And uh, we're excited about looking at a future trail study uh, along one of our corridors. Um, but we are optimistic that in the, the upcoming next call, call for that we will have other communities um, now more involved um, participating in our forum. So we appreciate Dr. Cox's support. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes all the remarks that I have and certainly going through each of the eight individual cell regions. And I think at this time, happy to take any comments or questions that folks may have. Any questions from uh, the board? I'll just say that was incredibly helpful. Appreciate all of you being here to uh, represent the, the individual forums. Not seeing any hands. Okay, we'll leave, leave that one behind and move ahead. And Mr. Cottrell, Perfect, thank you. it's you again, right? Uh, well, no, that item is just presented for information only. Okay. Um, again, if anybody has any questions on the administrative modifications, uh, please let staff know. Fantastic. With that, uh, our next meeting is the board meeting on September 21st, 2022. Again, that is designed to be an in-person meeting. Look for details on that. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank cool. you for Thanks, interpreters. Steve. Good, yes. night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very Good much. Night. Wow. Great job. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.